I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my administrative law class about the case National Federation of Independent Business, or NFIB, versus OSHA, the Occupational uh, Safety and Hazards Administration, a U.S. Supreme Court case from 2022. And we're really looking at this case. This is about the vaccine mandates for employers, um, or it's commonly called vaccine mandate. But the case is interesting for administrative law from the standpoint of something called the major questions doctrine. So let's look at what happens in this case. Um, oh, we start with OSHA. And so OSHA is um, a, under the Department of Labor and it promulgated what's called an emergency temporary standard, that's a term of art under its enabling statute, um, requiring workplaces with 100 or more employees to require their workers either to get the COVID vaccination or to get a COVID test every week and wear a mask while they're at work. And there were some narrow exceptions for um, uh, people who work from home, remote workers and so forth. Um, now, some business groups like the NFIB and a few states sought an emergency stay. So we have an emergency rule and then the parties asking for an emergency stay from the court, which the court granted. They granted the stay through a per curiam opinion, which means it's an anonymous majority opinion. So that means no one in the majority wanted to put their name on the majority opinion, maybe because... Um, it was obvious that thousands of people were going to die as a result um, of this case. And some um, per curiam decisions are actually even delegated just to the law clerks to write. Um, the court invalidated OSHA's rule saying it had acted outside of or exceeded its statutory authority because COVID is not specifically a workplace hazard, but rather a broad public health problem. So for my students, at the beginning of my course, I tell a story about um, spaghetti dinners and um, to basically to introduce the idea that agencies can only do things that are authorized under their enabling statute. So this case is really about whether OSHA can make the type of rule they did here under their enabling statute. Now, the split of justices clearly indicates that this was a is decided based on partisan political considerations, but um, the case is not supposed to be about the validity or merits of the rule itself, but whether um, the agency gets to do is the right agency to do this type of rule or can make this type of rule under their enabling statute. Note, by the way, that the court did allow OSHA to apply a rule like this to workplaces that pose special risks. So if OSHA, OSHA could show that there's some sort of unique or particularized risk in certain overcrowded workplaces or researchers, they mentioned labs that work directly with the virus and so forth, that they could require either masks at work or um, vaccinations for workers in those situations. I pulled out a quote for you that kind of highlights the crux of the per curiam decision rationale. We expect Congress to speak clearly, and I put that in bold myself, when authorizing an agency to exercise powers of vast economic and political significance. The question then is whether the act plainly authorizes the secretary's mandate. It does not. The act empowers the secretary to set workplace safety standards, not broad public health measures. And so this is um, a great example of a clear statement rule. And we're saying that um, we're not going to stretch the uh, meaning of the statute, even if you could arguably make some sort of attenuated argument that uh, the words could be construed in theory to give the OSHA uh, leeway to do this. Um, this is such a big deal. It's a, uh, um, a rule with such uh, vast economic and political significance, which is another way of saying it's so controversial that we want Congress to be explicit that they want the agency to do this. And the statute is not that explicit according to the per curiam decision. Um, there's a couple other uh, things I want to critique here about this opinion um, and or point out for my students that could be useful for kind of learning and the law. The majority opinion here mentions twice that, quote, the Senate passed a resolution disapproving of the regulation. I, uh, this is a little weird, right, that they, that they repeatedly refer to this. This refers to a failed attempt 
um, in Congress to derail by some members of Congress to derail the rule via the Congressional Review Act. So this kind of connects the case back to the, my lecture about the Chada uh, decision. And um, the con Congressional Review Act is our modern version of um, the line item veto, where basically if Congress doesn't like something in a, a specific ru new rule or action by an agency, they can, we can just pass a resolution, which is a lot easier than amending a statute, um, it, it, but it has to pass both houses of Congress and be signed by the president. And um, so the Senate passed a resolution to disapprove, knowing that the House was obviously not going to um, uh, affirm the resolution and President Biden was definitely not gonna sign it. So this was a, sort of a cheap political symbolic pol uh, political gesture by um, the members of the Senate who voted to disapprove of the resolution because they knew that it wasn't going to have any effect. And Biden had actually asked OSHA to promulgate a rule like this. Um, and so there was no question that this was sort of a political theater. Um, and this is really strange use of the legislative history by the conservative members of the court who historically have kind of um, identified themselves as textualists and been critical of an over-reliance or usage of uh, legislative history. And in particular, legislative history that's in, like negative space in the legislative history, like uh, proposed amendments or bills that were never enacted and things like that, and trying to read significance into that. So all of a sudden here we have something that's coming from the um, conservative majority on the court relying on a um, resolution that keeps mentioning a, a resolution under the Congressional Review Act that really only passed one house and was basically voted down by the other house and would not have been signed by the president. So I just think it's a little strange. Um, another thing about the majority opinion to recognize here is that it emphasizes the intrusiveness of mandating uh, so many workers get vaccinated, but it really skirts the point that the regulation actually allows workers to remain unvaccinated as long as they wear a mask at work and get tested regularly for COVID infection. And so they downplay that. Um, the dissent uh, gives uh, kind of emph more emphasis to that. Now, uh, this brings us to Justice Gorsuch's concurrence, which is, I think, actually the most important part of the case for the future. It's the part of the case most likely to be cited and most likely to um, uh, most important for um, uh, the development of administrative law doctrine. So, and that's specifically about the way he talks about something called the major questions doctrine, which Justice Gorsuch al almost always will refer referred to as the no elephants in mouse holes canon. That's a phrase that was introduced by Justice Scalia in the Whitman versus American trucking uh, case. Um, and it's really a type of clear statement rule. Um, so now please note that the majority, the per curiam decision actually never uses the phrase major questions, but Gorsuch says that their clear statement rule is basically um, the major questions doctrine. Now in the past, Major questions doctrine, if you're confused about this as a student, you should be, um, because in the past, this was basically a pretty rare Chevron exception. In other words, a reason to give no deference to an agency's interpretation of its enabling statute. Um, and But here, the major questions doctrine, instead of being a Chevron exception, becomes a standalone doctrine, basically a reason to invalidate um, any major agency regulations um, just from uh, right out of the gate. And Gorsuch connects it to the non-delegation doctrine, which he is a fan of and wants to kind of bring back in a really robust form, he's indicated in other opinions. Now, how is major questions doctrine similar to and different, for, similar to the non-delegation doctrine? Well, in both cases, we're concerned that um, about how much power Congress has given to an agency. The non-delegation doctrine is basically used for invalidating statutes and major questions doctrine is used for invalidating regulations um, by an agency. And on the non-delegation doctrine, we say the statute is too vague and gives too uh, um, overly broad discretion to the agency. And with major questions doctrine, we're saying that um, well, maybe the statute could mean a lot of different things or is a little ambiguous in places, but we're not going to um, let the agency do something as if they had had a lot of discretion conferred on them without some express and clear statement of Congress. So the, in some, as Justice Gorsuch notes, 
um, major questions doctrine is basically doing the work of the um, Lochner era non-delegation doctrine. Now, we have a dissent from three justices that's um, unusual in that it's co-authored um, instead of being written by one justice with others joining. And in the opinion of this professor, um, the dissent makes the better argument here about the OSHA statute in particular than the majority opinion does. Now, it starts with talking about the fact that from sort of a, a very formalistic a technical standpoint, this is a case about emergency stays, right? It's not about the validity of the agency's reasoning. It's not even supposed to be about its statute. Uh, in theory, procedurally, we're at the emergency, we're asking the Supreme Court for an emergency stay, and we have legal standards for granting an immediate stay. And the dissent says those were not satisfied here because the need for a stay has to be indisputably clear. And this was a temporary stay, that a rule that was only going to last six months. So it was not indisputably clear, according to the dissent, that we need to stop it immediately. Um, they also put a lot of emphasis on what's going on with COVID and why the agency's decision is actually eminently reasonable. Um, COVID spreads by, from person to person contact in confined indoor spaces, right? It's airborne. And so it causes, and causes harm in nearly all workplace environments. And so in those environments, more than any others, individuals have little control. So the majority makes a big, I'm gonna interrupt this for a moment. The majority emphasizes, look, you can get COVID at a concert or at the grocery store or someplace like that, but it's pretty easy to just not go to concerts or dance parties, or you can get curbside pickup at the grocery store. Um, but a lot of people really don't have a choice about going to work. It's um, They're stuck in a job that um, they're stuck with. and. So they therefore have little capacity to mitigate risks on their own. This is part of why we have OSHA in the first place, right? Is that in theory, you can quit your job and get another job, but a lot of people really aren't easily able to do that. And so um, COVID-19 in short is a menace in work settings. Returning to this quote, the proof is all around us. Since the disease's onset, most Americans have seen their workplaces transformed. And then here's the statute for uh, these emergency temporary um, rules. The, we, the agency needs to show that employees are exposed to grave danger from exposure to substances or agents determined to be toxic or physically harmful or from new hazards. And B, that such emergency standard is necessary to protect employees from such danger. And the dissent here says, look, a, a a pandemic, a once in a century pandemic like we have here is a new hazard and requiring either that the workers take precautions like masking and regular testing or they get vaccinated is a um, necessary to protect employees uh, from death and hospitalization. Um, the uh, statute says that OSHA's determinations continuing with the statute are supposed to be conclusive as long as they're supported by substantial evidence. Well, that, uh, if, if you tie this to the part of our course where we talk about standards of review, um, substantial evidence is pretty deferential, right? As long as there's evidence uh, supporting the um, agency's decision, the courts are supposed to defer. And so as the dissent points out, OSHA employs both in its enforcement and health divisions, numerous scientists, doctors, and other experts in public health, especially as it relates to work environments. And so why are these um, kind of unelected judges who, whose training was at law school second guessing this, these sort of battalions, these legions of scientists and doctors and public health experts um, that work for OSHA and um, try to hammer out the, the best and safest rules for workplaces. Um, the per curiam decision also tried to make a uh, emphasize that this was uh, this vaccine uh, rule was unprecedented that OSHA had never tried to do anything like this before and the dissent disagrees and says they got the history wrong OSHA has often issued rules I'm quoting here um, applying to all or nearly all workplaces in the nation that's definitely true affecting at once many tens of millions of employees and it has previously regulated infectious disease that's also true there's all sorts 
sorts of um, safety precautions at the workplace to, for cl cleaning and hygiene and so forth. And that has included at times facilitating vaccinations. And it has in other contexts required medical examinations and face coverings for employees. And so uh, we even study some other um, cases in my course where um, different agencies required x-rays and things like that in order to um, where uh, if there were co certain complaints by workers or injuries by workers and so on. So it's definitely, there's a long history of OSHA requiring um, medical tests and or for uh, employees to wear masks when they're dealing with dangerous products and so on. And that concludes our lecture about the NFIB versus OSHA and the vaccine mandate.